gaps in between. Um, when you when you run a hospital, um, you you kind of prepare for incidents um, that that actually happen probably a little bit more often than the general public realise. Um, so things like running out of beds at, during winter is seen as a, a critical incident. Running out of water, which has happened in the last year, uh, where we had an hour and a half. Uh, water supply left because there had been a, um, a, a, a burst water main um, nearby um, and, and various other things, scaffolding falling down outside the hospital. And so we often prepare for major incidents um, and usually um, you mobilise the teams and we manage whatever that is, you know, big road traffic accidents or you know, terrorist attack or whatever it is and everybody works together all the emergency services work together in a very coordinated well rehearsed way and the incident may last you know up to one day it might last three days if it means we haven't got enough beds and then it finishes and everyone's happy that it's over and we recover and we go back to normal and this, of course, has been a very different sort of incident that has gone on and on and on um, with little sign of recovery. And we've had to um, sort of change at a rapid speed and be very agile as we've gone along. And the Royal Free Hospital is, is one of the only hospitals in the country that has a high contagion unit. So patients who have Ebola, or any other sort of hemorrhagic disease, or SARS, MERS, any of these really horrible, highly contagious diseases, we're quite used to managing and dealing with. And very often we repatriate patients from overseas and they arrive in the hospital, and we have a really big team who can manage that. And we very often, we will have one of our uh, rooms in our high contagion unit being used for these patients um, sometimes we've had to push it as far as two um, at the peak of our uh, the, the super surge of covid patients we had nearly 300 positive covid patients and 90 something suspected covid patients so we have, and very similar to other acute trusts. So we were dealing with something at a completely different level. Our first patient um, arrived with us on the 9th of February. Um, he was actually uh, the super spreader, as was called in, in, in the press. Um, and the Royal Free was one of five designated hospitals in the country to take positive COVID patients at that time. I mean, actually, he was a person, he wasn't a patient, because he was actually well. He was asymptomatic and completely well. Um, but there was lots of um, sort of fuss, and we were really trying to mobilise quickly at that point. But at the same time, thinking it might not happen to us, and we might be able to be in this containment phase and not have to worry. Um, we spent a lot of February planning and, and getting our surge plans together, but people were very quickly getting more and more ill and there were rising numbers in the hospital. I remember at the beginning of March, um, pulling together a, a, a Q and A session uh, with the hospital, uh, with my executive colleagues because we thought it would be really important to talk to everybody face to face. I mean, things have so moved on since then, because we would, of course, never now do a face to face with that many people. Um, but we filled our atrium in the Royal Free, which is like a massive sort of like conference center space. And there must have been over 500 people in that room. We were actually squashed in quite closely. Um, and we could feel 
the palpable fear in the room and people were very scared, very nervous about what was to come. Um, over the next couple of weeks, um, we rapidly filled up and probably about 10 days before lockdown, um, no, maybe about a week before lockdown, we closed our doors to any relatives and visitors. We felt that was the most important thing to do for the safety of our patients and our staff and for the safety of those wanting to visit. And, and I have to say that was probably um, the hardest decision we made um, because we very much um, see patients as part of a, you know, a social system and the benefits of having relatives and family visiting uh, is, is immeasurable. So doing that, we realized we were taking a massive step and we could only put ourselves in that um, space of what it must be like for a patient and or a relative to not see their loved ones at such a, a difficult time. Um, when the national lockdown took place on the 23rd of March, our, our numbers were at that point very high indeed. And the, the following two weeks, um, really the, the week of 6th of April, so the week towards Pesach uh, was uh, our, 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 our super surge week. At that point, 90% of our beds were full of COVID positive or suspected patients. We actually cancelled bank holidays for everybody. At that point, everybody was working six or seven days a week. Um, it was you know, incredibly hard. We, we um, really lost count of, of, of what day it was or what was happening because it, it felt very hard to keep managing, um, keeping a hospital running at that point. We have um, a 32 bedded, um, 34 bedded ITU, and we have eight um, high dependency beds as well. At that point during Pesach, we had 70 patients needing ITU, needing ventilation. So we had um, changed around, moved ITU beds into one of our wards, and we were having to. Um, train up other staff who were not used to working um, in an intensive care facility uh, to do that. And I cannot um, express um, just what a task that was. If you think in um, normal times that we care for patients on a one-to-one -one basis in intensive care and you have additional staff as runners, um, and at this point, you know, there, there is a, obviously a big uh, vacancy, a big shortage of nursing staff nationally, and in particular, a huge uh, lack of intensive care nurses. So to sort of dub, more than double our IT capacity was very hard. So we began training up staff to support our ITU staff. So instead of being on a ratio of one nurse to one patient, we worked on the ratio of one nurse to three patients with non-ITU nurses looking after individual patients. There was no patient who was ever on their own and they had an ITU nurse nearby to help them. So the anxiety of the staff was huge because very, Often they were working in areas that they're not comfortable in, that they're not trained in specifically. Um, we had had to stop all our elective surgery. Uh, we're one of the biggest uh, cancer treatment centres in London. And we had to stop the majority of our, our cancer work. We had to stop all our elective diagnostic work and overnight stopped all our outpatients coming. Um, we're a, a transplant centre as well, and all our liver and uh, kidney transplants also had to stop overnight. So it felt, in other areas of the hospital, very empty. Those huge main arterial corridors in the Royal Free, if you know it, which has usually got lots of bustling people coming in and out, were just 
absolutely empty. Um, and our security guards were stopping everybody from coming into the hospital, which was very distressing. We had very distressed, anxious relatives begging to come in or begging to give food for their loved ones. Um, and I think we found that really hard. Our, um, our focus was on the safety of the patients and, of course, on the safety of our staff, um, who not only were working in areas that they were sometimes um, were, were unfamiliar to them, but also had their own anxieties, as we all did. Um, they were fearful of uh, coronavirus. They were fearful about what was going to happen with their children, worried about homeschooling, and all, all those issues that, that we've, we've all had to think about. Um, there was also the issue of PPE. Um, we never once ran out of PPE at the Royal Free. It was a bit of a logistical nightmare, ensuring that um, every day we had enough gloves, masks, visors, gowns. Um, we, you know, there, there were times when our, we almost ran out of gowns. If you think our intensive care unit alone at the peak was using about 1,400 gowns a day, uh, because every time a member of staff has to go out of ITU, whether that's to go on a break after four hours of working or going to have a drink or going to the toilet, they have to take off the PPE and then that gets thrown away and incinerated and they have to put on a new layer. With 70 patients, we had uh, sort of nearly 300 people working a shift at any one time. Um, so you can see how, how much we needed. In fact, when we almost ran out, and the logistics were getting very difficult nationally to get us enough PPE. Um, one of our doctors who works in intensive care, her mother uh, works for the um, Central School of Fashion and rallied her furloughed staff to work in Hampstead Town Hall and begin making gowns out of our theatre drapes those big sheets of sort of waterproof funny material that you drape over a patient before you operate on them. And we gave them all of that and they used um, those drapes to sew gowns. Um, in fact, the members of our community worked in, in that place and still do volunteering and making those gowns. When I went to visit that town hall, I have to say I found it incredibly emotional. Just seeing people that had felt originally that there was nothing they could do to help and sewing, I mean, it was taking about 30 minutes to sew a gown um, to keep my staff protected, which was just fantastic and, and really overwhelming. Um, we also, um, uh, during this time, um, we were trying to do everything we could to make it a little bit easier for our staff. Um, we managed to provide free meals 24 hours a day for our staff so they didn't have to worry about bringing food in or worry about queuing uh, for food, although I have to say the queues for the free food were quite long. Um, and we opened up that offer to other members of the public sector. So a lot of London Ambulance Service, Hatsola, um, St. John's Ambulance, even London Fire Brigade and the police used our facilities as well. It was a really lovely gesture of the Royal Free Hospital to do that. Um, we also um, provided an advice line, um, and that was for anybody I'm wanting to know um, if I don't want to come in on public transport, where can I park or how do I get um, swabbed if I, I think I'm COVID positive and all that, all the things that you can think of. Because we were running a major incident, 
we set up an incident room seven days a week. And that was really focused very much on our logistics and getting enough PPE in every day. We also provided a psychological support team um, so that our staff could be briefed and debriefed every day. Um, we had a wonderful, we still do have a wonderful uh, project ongoing um, uh, where staff from the airline industry who have been furloughed come in every day, take up part of our uh, restaurant space and offer a first class service to our staff. So if they just want to come downstairs and chat to the airline um, host and hostesses and just have a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and just sort of let go in terms of what they've been dealing with, uh, which has also been a wonderful thing. Throughout um, all of this time, um, dealing with a, an incident that none of us had ever dealt with before and trying to lead a, um, a very large organization through something um, quite stressful. Um, I happened to have a, a BBC crew on my shoulder for most of that time, um, which was very strange um, and a bit odd. And there were certain times um, when things happened or we heard stuff in a meeting where I probably reacted slightly different to if I didn't have a, a camera pointing in my face. Um, so if any of you saw the BBC hospital documentary um, aired a couple of weeks ago, many people said that I looked very calm, but in actual fact, um, what I wanted to say, I couldn't say in camera because I was so petrified. Um, we, I suppose I, I should mention that we also had an awful lot of staff from other organisations who came to work with us. So we had um, staff from Great Ormond Street who obviously look after children um, where they had stopped all their elective surgery as well um, and they sent some of their nurses over to us. I had staff from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore, who also sent their staff over, which was um, incredible. Plus a huge swathe of medical students who either during their training or towards the end of their training came and helped, um, which was absolutely fantastic and really, really got us through this. And so we officially exited phase one of the COVID uh, incident about three weeks ago, uh, about the sort of mid beginning, middle of May. And we've officially moved into phase two, which is all about stepping up activity that has been stopped and prioritizing those patients who have been waiting for surgery during this time, because we've stopped for three months um, delivering surgery and outpatients to those patients. A lot of our cancer treatment and cancer surgery has continued to take place in the private sector on our behalf with our surgeons. And now, um, I suppose it's right to say that we're, we're getting ready for another spike in case there is one. Um, I think I said on the programme that it felt like we were building an aeroplane while, while we were in the air. And what what I'm trying to do now is make sure that if there is another spike, that we're more prepared than we were and we will be able to mobilise pretty quickly if that happens. Um, I think that might be a good place to pause, Stephen, and, and ask. For, I, can, I could keep going forever, but, but I think it's interesting if people have got questions that they want to ask. Oh, we've got lots and lots of questions for you, Rachel. Um, so let me start with a question from Re Wendy Skolnick. Um, are any of your intensive care staff suffering now with PTSD or longer term mental health issues? And how will the NHS deal with that? Mm -hmm. So um, 
we we had uh, mobilized a very big psychological support team um, from the very beginning of the crisis. Um, I think none of us are under any illusion that this will not have long-term effects on individuals. Um, I don't know yet whether they have PTSD. It's probably too soon to say. There have certainly been a lot of members of staff who have used our support services so far. And I'm under no illusion that there will be many, many more as the days, weeks and months go forward. Um, I think for a lot of people, um, it, I, I mean, it was incredibly shocking um, the high numbers of very, very sick people that they were looking after. And there was a lot of people who died during that time. And for anyone um, in this day and age, we're not used to doing that, especially actually in intensive care. They are more used to um, getting patients better and discharging them um, than managing them when they die. So um, we are really open and aware that PTSD is going to be something very real for many of our staff. And um, I think we will be, well, hopefully we will be there for them to give them the support that they will need. Thanks, Rachel. And a little follow up from me, which is, um, you've had people working six days, seven days, long shifts and all of this for several months now. Um, and at some stage, these people have got to have a break, haven't they? They're going, mm. to, um, they're going to have a lot of backlog of holiday and all sorts of things. Um, are you going to run out of staff? It's a really good question. Um, we uh, have, in the last three weeks, have been encouraging staff to take their leave. People have not wanted to take their leave because they are waiting for you know, somewhere to go to take their leave as well. But it's really important that we all take very regular breaks. Um, we made the decision that any leave that wasn't taken or any leave that they want to take but have been unable to do so, they can carry over over the next two years because we recognise to expect people to take their leave in the next financial year would just not be possible. And as you say, It'll mean everybody will be off at the same time. We've already had to deal with, during that peak um, of the 6th of April, uh, nearly 15% of our staff were off sick or shielding or isolating. So we were managing on with the, the highest numbers of very sick patients with the smallest numbers of staff in the building. Uh, we, we absolutely don't want to... Um, go through that again okay so a really good question here from i'm guessing it's rachel marcus it's certainly from her iphone um, who asks what for you will be the top three topics for the almost inevitable public inquiry um well i suppose one of the issues will be um, the preparedness, um, which includes the amount of PPE um, that was available for everybody. Um, I have to say at this point, very, very quickly, as soon as um, we, we realised that this was obviously going to be a, an incident, a national incident, every decision that we made as an executive team has been properly minuted and recorded um, so that in the event of any inquiry uh, we would be able to confirm how we reached a decision um, and uh, what decision was made following that so that at least when we look back and if we made the wrong decision we would be able to understand why we came to that decision at that time with the information we had at that time Obviously, hindsight is a, a great thing. Um, I think, personally, for me, we spent a, a ridiculous amount of time. I think it was towards the end of January, right up to the middle of February, 
talking about these pods that we had to build outside the hospital where we were going to be swabbing patients and having drive through swabbing. Um, there was so much time, money, effort discussing the pods when actually we should have been discussing more about the surging of our ITU facilities. Um, in a way, we were quite lucky because we were one of the first trusts that had patients where we realised quite soon we would need um, expanded ITU facilities that we were able to mobilise and get more beds in when we needed it. I think undoubtedly uh, the final thing that will be questioned was uh, the use of Nightingale hospitals and, um, and whether that was or was not a good decision at the time. Okay, and I'm sure there'll be loads more questions that people will be asking about this for the next few years. In fact, there'll be a whole industry of inquiries. Um, Marilyn Grant has asked a question. She says, I've often wondered why the gowns were not washed instead of being thrown away. Is it a lack of capacity for washing or are medical gowns not suitable to be washed? So the gowns are made not of um, a sort of uh, a proper material, a thick cotton like our operating scrubs are made of. They're made of that sort of, um, a sort of waterproof papery gowns uh, and specifically because they are incinerated. And because we knew, we know that coronavirus is a very virulent um, and highly <coughs> contagious um, uh, uh, virus, um, we knew that we would have to um, uh, incinerate everything afterwards, which is, which is why. Um, it feels really bad that, in fact, the woman who set up our um, Hampstead Town Hall uh, gown making facility um, felt, felt very um, pulled because she normally lectures and makes uh, clothes that are fully sustainable and believes in sustainable fashion. So we were going against all her principles. Um, but on this occasion, um, she understood why. Okay. And Judith Morgan has asked if you could tell us a bit more about the oxygen oxygen shortage. Where are the new tanks and are you going to keep them now you've got them? Yes. So that, this was a very, one of the exciting elements of the BBC programme documentary. Um, we, I mean, a supply of oxygen is something that we have never ever had to worry about in a hospital. I think it did describe in the BBC documentary that we were using in two days what we usually use in just over a month. Um, so for every person who was on oxygen needing about 10 to 15 litres an hour, and we had nearly 400 people needing that, we were going through our 3,000, um, our, 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 our original oxygen tank, um, w which has up to 3,000 uh, uh, metres in it. Um, and we went through this very, very stressful period where alarms were going off and we really did worry that we were going to have a catastrophic um, cut of all our oxygen. So our new oxygen cylinder arrived and um, I have to say at the time that we were running out and we were asking the Department of Health if we could have uh, a, a new oxygen cylinder because they were trying to, because everyone was worrying about it and we were worrying about whether there would be one for us. And at that time there were only two available in the country and we were incredibly lucky to be offered it. Now, some of this was because of the Nightingale hospitals that were being set up around the country who needed the other ones. Um, so um, ours was put in very, very quickly within a sort of, I think about 16 days, which is sort of unheard of. Um, it is now sitting on the other side of the hospital. It's full. 
uh, we our unit obviously we haven't got nearly as many patients with COVID in as we had then. Um, if there is a second spike, we will absolutely need that oxygen cylinder. If there isn't a spike, it will still be used. We, we're the way we've worked it is it will um, the, the new oxygen cylinder supplies oxygen to our second, third, and fourth floors, which actually covers all our ITU capacity and our theatres capacity. And then the other old oxygen cylinder supplies the rest of the tower. I've become okay. an expert in oxygen in the last um, six weeks, having never had anything to do with it before. Sounds like you've had to learn about quite a lot of new things. <laughs> Um, Dave Rich is asking, are you still seeing a lot of new cases of COVID? I assume the numbers dropped considerably during lockdown, but have they started to pick up again? Mm. So um, up until um, Friday, uh, we were seeing about, um, we, we usually have between about 35 to 60 patients being admitted a day generally. And um, I think on Friday, I think we had four admitted with COVID positive and the rest were not, were, were not suspected. Um, it had gone down to about two. Um, and I know that um, other hospitals in Southwest of London and Northwick Park are now seeing a bit of a, um, an uptick in numbers. And when we were going through our big numbers, those were the hospitals that were about five or six days ahead of us at the Royal Free. And that's because of the demographic of the population. If they have an older population or BAME communities um, that, that would see a, a, a bigger um, or a quicker swing in uptake. So at the moment, no, we're, we're on our lowest numbers and specifically our lowest numbers in ITU, which is always the best um, indicator of how sick a population is. Um, so at the moment, no, we, we've still seen everything down. I mean, we probably will see, we, you know, a couple of weeks ago with the hot weather, uh, and after the Dominic Cummings incident, um, that's when we saw a lot of people out on the streets and on the heath and everything. So you'd expect with the, the way COVID works that, uh, you know, between 14 and 21 days, we're going to see an uptick. So it will be over the next couple of weeks, we'll see something. And then, of course, with the recent demonstrations over this weekend, we would expect to see another uptick in two weeks. Or not, if as they say, the infection may be dying out or not being so virulent. It's so difficult to know because nobody knows. Oh. Um, Karen Ackerman's asked, can you tell us about the decision process around the TV programme? Did you consider saying no and what made you say yes to the BBC? Um, so, when I mean they approached us uh, because um, they approached us knowing that we were one of the first hospitals uh, to be receiving COVID patients. Um, we all thought very long and hard about it. However, um, the episodes and the series that had gone before us were done in a very compassionate and kind way that those people in those hospitals were portrayed as good, well-intended people as opposed to being um, dissing of those people. And we felt it was not a politicized uh, method of working. Um, we, the, the, com the TV company were quite keen to reassure us that because they were going to turn around the production of the documentary incredibly quickly, in less than 10 days from finishing filming, um, it was aired. Um, 
they reassured us that it would be aired at a time uh, when COVID was still very uh, prominent in our minds. And we felt, therefore, it was going to be hopefully seen as a, a bit of a public service documentary and to give people the reassurance about the NHS, not just about the Royal Free, but about the NHS, that we didn't, um, had never done this before, um, but uh, people were in safe hands. Just out of interest, um, I don't know whether we'll be able to see this, but can all the people who've seen that documentary give a wave on screen just so we can see you? Seems like quite a lot of people were watching you, Rachel. <laughs> um, I think there were three million people have now watched it, which right. is quite high for that. I'm quite surprised, but um, that's quite impressive, really. Somebody has asked what's a really good question, I think. Um, do you see hospitals as being the new hotspots for infection going forward? Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, um, you know, we, we haven't, a, a new um, government guidance came out at five o'clock on Friday, giving hospitals new guidance about visiting and how we were going to manage relatives and who had to wear masks and whatever. And at this moment in time, uh, we at the Royal Free are not comfortable about letting non-essential people back into our hospital. Um, it is still a highly contagious virus and which does kill people. And I think we're going to have to do a lot of soul searching before we open up our doors. Uh, to normal visiting as we once knew. Um, we've just started last week um, antibody testing for all our staff. Um, the very early uh, signs were saying of those staff who were swabbed positive, so those staff who were had positive antibodies, 30% of those uh, had not had coronavirus symptoms. And I think, I mean, that was, that's a, it was a really, that, I think we, that sample came from the first day of sampling. So a really small sample, not statistically viable, but I think it gives you the idea that of those staff who are um, tested as having positive antibodies, if a third of those staff are positive, which you should, from that, indi it indicates that they have had COVID, but yet they were asymptomatic and didn't think they had had it. I think that just goes to show um, how virulent the virus is in, that, in, in a place like a hospital. Um, and I think it's the same for care homes. And I think until we've swabbed everyone, um, and we really try and sort out the track and trace programs. Um, I, I think we, it, it, the hospitals are part of the problem of the continuation of COVID. Um, well, I have to say, I'm very nervous about the track and trace uh, because it could wipe out half my staff in the hospital if everyone who has been in contact with somebody who's been um, tracked and traced um, and you have to be off for 14 days I think there's a real concern there. So the government are now saying that they want you to start accepting visitors again? Um, no they, they've given they've given guidance for if you are accepting visitors they oh, have right. said so it will they've said it, it's locally agreed um, okay but, but we, we as I say it came out at I mean, great that the Department of Health sends stuff out at five o'clock on a Friday. Um, so I haven't had a chance to discuss it with my executive colleagues yet. Um, right. but, but we'll have to look into that. Um, Lawrence and Deborah Cohen are asking, how did the staff feel about the Thursday evening cap clap for carers? Oh, my goodness. That first Friday, after the first time of the clapping, 
um, there was such a buzz in the hospital about it. Um, it was really overwhelming, really emotional. Um, it gave us all, um, we were talking about it on that Friday. I remember that Friday so well. There was such a buzz and everyone was saying it made it all worthwhile. Um, it, it made such a difference, I cannot tell you. Um, and to all of you who were out clapping, um, I really extend my gratitude to you because it, it made such a difference, such a, a small gesture. Uh, it was absolutely incredible and it really, really made a difference. I know towards the end, um, it, it sort of, I think it became a bit tiring for, I mean, certainly when I was clapping outside, because you're sort of thinking, when will this end? Not the clapping, but it kind of used to bring it home. That's almost how you counted the weeks by thinking, how many weeks have we come out here clapping? Um, but it, 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 it was so impactful. Who would have thought? that that gesture would make such a difference, but it really, really did. It was absolutely fantastic. And other little things, um, you know, photographs of people's homes with rainbows in the windows, chalk pictures on the ground. I mean, still, as I walk around Muswell Hill and East Finchley and I see that in people's um, windows and on the pavements, it, it is, um, it is incredibly moving and incredibly supportive um, for the staff, um, really amazing. We've got an enormous number of questions still coming in, Rachel, and I'm not going to keep you much beyond nine o'clock. So some of the people who've asked questions, if I don't get your question, I apologise now. One here from Lisa Wimborn who asks, many of the tenants we support at JBD, which I presume is Jewish, Blind and Deaf, are reluctant to go to hospital, even if they clearly need to. How can I reassure them that they will be safe and kept apart from COVID patients? I, I, don't, I don't think at this time we can reassure anybody um, because, uh, you know, uh, you know who, I, I just don't think we can reassure anybody. What I can say is, is that the work we're doing at the moment to make sure that people who attend hospital um, for an elective, for a planned procedure, um, we are asking them all, they have to shield for 14 days prior to coming in for an operation because they have to be squeaky clean so that they don't contaminate our staff or our premises. Um, so we, we are literally sort of almost like rebuilding the inside of the hospital. So if you come to A&E, you obviously will go to a, what we're calling a COVID managed channel, um, where we are expecting you to literally just walk off the street or come in from an ambulance. And you will be treated by people in full PPE. Um, and you will not go, pass through any clean COVID protected areas at all. If you are coming in for a procedure or an outpatient appointment or a planned diagnostic like a, an MRI, you will be asked to shield for whatever the specified number of days is for that particular procedure. And then at least we can give you some reassurance that you will not come into contact with any other patient or member of staff um, that isn't also COVID protected. So at the moment, we are making sure that, for example, um, the surgeon who operates on you um, is, is clean, has been swabbed, has um, had their temperature checked that morning, has had a well-being check. Um, but they haven't just come straight from A&E, from treating somebody in A&E who's just come through the front door coughing everywhere. So you can imagine it's been a bit of a logistical nightmare. And we, this is why we haven't fully started all our elective surgery. And it'll be a very, very long time before we do. Um, 
but we're testing pathways at the moment. Um, but that, that's as much reassurance at the moment that we can give. Um, our, the numbers of patients coming through A&E at the moment is probably a little bit more than half uh, to what the numbers were before the COVID crisis. So people are still keeping away, which is not such a bad thing, but in some cases, I think people were using us as quite a, uh, a convenient GP surgery sometimes. Um, however, it worried us that all the patients who used to come to us, we're a heart attack centre as well at the Royal Free, and you wonder where, where were all those patients and all the patients who used to come having had a stroke. And I mean, that wasn't just us, that was the whole of London that noticed a real drop in those numbers of patients. So we're hoping the right patients will come back to A&E and feel reassured um, that we are trying to keep the place as clean as possible. You will notice probably um, in the next week or so, it'll be very clear at the front door of A&E who is allowed to go in what door when. Right, um, and also haven't you got some of your smaller satellite hospitals within the trust that you've kept completely Correct. Isolated. Yeah, so Chase Farm Hospital is going to be completely COVID protected. So just cold planned elective surgery and diagnostics. And Barnett, who's also within the Royal Free Group, they will also be the same as us, um, which is, um, they, they obviously have an A&E there, um, but they will also be doing some um, outpatient appointments, but they will mostly be a, um, a COVID managed site. The right. fact that we do transplants um, uh, at the Royal Free means that we can't just be um, very clean, we have to be squeaky clean for those patients. It, I mean, it's, it's quite incredible um, when you think there are hospitals, for example, in Germany where you know, you are not allowed in that hospital without covering your feet, um, your shoes with, with you know, proper coverings. Um, and, you know, it now makes you think, actually, we should have, you know, perhaps we should have been a lot cleaner than we were. Perhaps we should have been more restrictive for many years. You know, is it a wonder that, that we've got MRSA or C. diff or any of the other infections it does it does make you think um about you know wouldn't we want our hospitals to be the cleanest possible places to reassure our patients indeed um this is a tough question um and if you want to duck it that's fine warren taylor's asked well the question says was there any thinking at the time of the effect of releasing people back into care homes i'm sure there was thinking so what was it uh, i mean that's a really good question um well at the very beginning the um the thinking was we wanted to empty the hospitals as quickly as possible because we thought we weren't going to have enough acute beds for the numbers coming in. So there was a real push to discharge our patients back home and back into care homes. We, um, there were many times that we weren't, we didn't have enough swabs to check the COVID status of those patients. It was more important that we use the swabs to check the COVID status of the patients coming in rather than testing them going out. So we resorted to um, clinical diagnoses. Um, so checking out that if a patient had been swabbed, let's say seven days previously, um, we were, would assume then that their COVID status, or they were not infectious. So that definitely happened at the very beginning and towards the peak. I think at that point, um, certainly as a trustee of Jewish care and knowing how Jewish care was managing, um, who sort of really put the brakes on receiving from hospitals. I mean, what was difficult 
was a patient who had come from a care home um, and had come in having been swabbed positive in the care home coming in we would fix them up and we wouldn't be allowed to send them back to their own home so that was tricky it could have caused tension but i think we really understood why 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 that was happening i do think that some of the care home exacerbation of covid was because of the numbers of patients being sent back from hospital without a doubt we were part of the cause and talking about swabbing the question is there any evidence yet of the accuracy of either the initial swab test or the antibody tests um i'm not an infectious diseases expert and i think all of us will know people who very obviously had covid symptoms but was swabbed negative um, and because you know when we were had lots and lots of patients coming through a and e um, you know the turnaround of the swab results was sometimes up to 72 hours so you cannot isolate somebody in a and e waiting 72 hours because we obviously just haven't got that space so we had to put every patient who was suspected into a side room so that they wouldn't then contaminate anybody else. We're quite lucky at the Royal Free in that we have quite a lot of side rooms, but many hospitals run out. Um, I think that we had many um, false positives. We also had false negatives. <coughs> Very often, the clinicians would make a diagnosis based on somebody's x-ray and the clinical symptoms they were showing. And, and as you know, um, not, you know, the criteria for whether somebody is COVID positive or not um, for a long time was saying fever plus cough, when actually now they are saying that if you lose your sense of smell and taste, that is a bigger indicator um, than anything else. So I'm certainly not blaming PHE their guidance or anything because like everybody else they're learning as we go along uh, but we've learned an awful lot um i'm gonna just ask a couple more rachel if you're all right with that um miriam sure. asked has anyone who previously tested positive for covid later <laughs> tested negative on the antibody test oh yeah an awful lot yeah, and, and we don't know what that's about. Some of that is about um, the viral load that we think people may have been exposed to. One of my colleagues um, who was swabbed positive for COVID uh, had her um, antibody test about 18 days post swabbing and she was negative. That might be that that was too soon afterwards. Um, you know, I, I, you know, and some of the swabs, I mean, as you've heard in, in the press, um, you know, some haven't, you know, clearly the reagents aren't working or, or whatever. I, I mean, I still don't know, you know, if you are swabbed uh, for your antibody to, or you, it's a blood test, but if you have an antibody test and you are seen to be uh, having positive antibodies, I don't really know what what that's going to tell you to be honest um you know I, I suppose it means that if i know that you have positive antibodies you may be a bit safer to sit next to than somebody that that doesn't but i i don't i don't know what it's going to tell you it's probably nice to know but i don't know i mean our behavior still has to stay the same we still have to keep a distance we still have to wash our hands um and all the other things that we've been told to do. I have to say, actually, interestingly, um, in, during the COVID crisis, the number of infections in the hospital, like um, C. diff and, and everything else that you get in hospitals, has gone right down um, because everybody's washing their hands, no doubt. Right. And um there's a question here, which I think is a really good question to draw towards a close, which is, 
If there were to be a second spike, what have you learned from patients that would influence how you may treat patients with COVID-19 in the future? Oh my goodness, I would need another hour, but um, in a nutshell, um, we used an awful lot of staff um, to sit with patients uh, using uh, WhatsApp and FaceTime to speak to their families. Um, in those early days, we uh, were moving patients, as I explained, quite quickly up from A&E into a side room and then into another room. And then as they deteriorated into ITU and then out again, and their property got completely lost in a way that we've never had in the hospital before. Plus, if they were positive, it was unclear whether we should move their potentially contaminated property with them into ITU, which is why it would get left behind. So we've now sorted out a process. Again, hindsight's a great thing. So we would sort out that property a bit better. Um, I think there's an awful lot about, um, you know, we've had a lot of experience of patients who have been in ITU for a very long length of time, as you've seen in the news. Um, it's very unusual for people to be in intensive care or certainly um, intubated uh, for, for a very long time. Um, <coughs> so um, a lot of our patients who have come out of that coma are um, delirious and, and quite unwell, mainly because of the amount of drugs we gave them to keep them sedated for all that time. Um, so I think there is, I'm sure, huge amounts we will learn from the patients about their post-COVID experience and about how they would um, advise us on how we should treat other patients about when they come round from that sort of coma. Um, oh, I, just so, so many things that, and, and a lot more that we need to consolidate from that. Right. Um, we've had lots of people wanting to say thank you to you and everybody at the Royal Free and everybody in the health service. But I just want to read um, a message from John Josephs. He said, I was in Ward 10 West with COVID from the 29th of March to the 6th of April. In the bed opposite Peter, one of the patients featured on the BBC programme. I can't praise too highly the care I received, the kindness of the staff and their expertise. And I think it was amazing that none of them at any time gave any indication of the pressure they must have been under or their stress. Um, and I think, you know, maybe you could take that one back to somebody in the hospital. Wow, um, I absolutely will. And this is the absolute last question, everybody. I'm sorry if I missed your question. I've done my best. Um, <laughs> but I've saved this one to the end because it just seemed... Um, the perfect one to finish with from Suzanne. She asks, how do you manage to remain so calm and who do you turn to, to for support? Um, as I, I outwardly hope I look calm, um, but very often inside I'm, I'm really sometimes stuck uh, to know what to do. Um, Unfortunately, during this time, a lot of the things that I would do normally to de-stress and decompress, such as yoga or um, seeing my friends and family, uh, you know, my extended family is incredibly important to me. Um, so just like all of you, the things that I would normally do to decompress, I've not been able to do. Um, and... Um, I think my husband's probably still on the line. You're, he's probably the best person to ask, but I think he will agree that there were probably a good three and a half, four weeks uh, when I would leave very, very early in the morning and come back very, very late at night for six, seven days a week. And I didn't actually say or do very much in those 
husband of seven hours that I was at home. So I suppose we all deal with stress in our own ways. Um, I, I'm incredibly lucky. I'm one of the privileged who um, actually got to go to work every day. Um, I was getting paid for the job that I do. I wasn't furloughed. I didn't work from home. And I know for a lot of people, learning to work from home has been a great thing. Um, but my structure to my day continued as normal. And I work with um, truly amazing people. Um, and, and I'm not to, just talking about um, my colleagues and my team, but, um, you know, my they're just fantastic bunch of staff who I'm incredibly grateful to know and, and very privileged to work with, which make, makes it very easy. Well, you make it sound easy. I don't think many of us think it's easy. Uh, Rachel, I'm going to unmute everybody. Oh, I can't. Rabbi. Can you do the unmuting of everybody? Um, yeah, unmuted. <laughs> okay, Unless so people want to unmute themselves. Please for Rachel. Thank you. Amazing, Rachel. Really amazing. Really amazing, Rachel. Um, I can't. Uh, 